So we will call this meeting to order for Thursday, December 9th. Um, first item on the agenda is public invited to be heard. I don't believe we have anyone, but just double checking uh, Karen and Erica. Yeah, I don't believe we have any public, do we, Erica? Nope, nobody. Okay. Um, just us. The next item is approving the minutes from our November 10th and December 1st meetings. Is there any discussion or questions or I would entertain a motion to approve the minutes? Yes, Karen Phillips. You're muted. I have to unmute myself. I, uh, I forgot what I was gonna say. <laughs> I'm old. Um, I make a motion to accept the minutes. Okay, do we have a second from Deanna? All those in favor, please raise your hand. Okay, so approved. The next item on our agenda is to discuss and provide direction about allocating the remaining 2022 Human Service Agency funding. Karen Roney, uh, was Ellie Berto going to present? Ellie Berto is going to lead us. He is no longer here. Where's our Texas Longhorn? He got disconnected or something. He was here a few minutes ago. Yeah, yeah he was. In all his glory. Hopefully he didn't have a... Uh, a major technical issue. Are you going to check in on him, Karen? Yeah, I am. Okay, so we'll give that another minute or two while you do that, because we don't have much else to do besides that. Mm -hmm. Oh, there's a 303 number that has dialed in that ends in 599. Hang but on. I don't know who that is. Um, Hi, this is Brian. Hi, hello, Brian. I'm sorry that I, I can't get on the video link. I have a very poor internet connection. Okay, that's okay. I, I am coming back online. I'm not sure what happened. Okay, we're looking for the Longhorn. <laughs> All right, bye. So while we're waiting for Eliberto, um, I did send you all, I don't know whether you had a chance to open it and look at it, uh, a copy of the information that we included in the council packet for our December 14th presentation. Um, so the, the council that, that has been posted to the, um, to the website, um, we did send out letters to all of the agencies. We did that on, I don't know, was that Friday, Erica? We, we oh, did it Friday. right, yeah, yeah. So on Friday, we sent out that information. So the agencies received the information. They, uh, the council has gone back to virtual meetings. And so we did indicate in the letter to the agencies how they can um, access the information that's in the council packet, how they can view the uh, council meeting, and if they want to uh, participate and call in and provide public comment in the meeting, we gave them instructions for how to do that. Um, so just, just wanted to let you know that. And, and Caitlin, to your question, um, the um, and really any of the advisory board members, if you want to, um, we will send you that same information. So, I mean, if you want to join in um, and be part of the, the, the meeting, we can send you a, um, a link to that, um, or you can watch it on, on, um, on, on YouTube. So I think for, uh, for Caitlin and, and how this works is that um, you have to, come on to the meeting, like before the meeting, 
and then if if um, and then if you have to wait for your item to you know come up, then you just turn off your video and turn off your mic and uh, do other right. things <laughs> until the time. Uh, so so I'm assuming, Caitlin, that we will um, you know we will uh, invite you to come into that and be on the the meeting. I think unless if anyone else wants a speaking part, then um, or to make any comments if any questions come up. Then, um, then you can just watch it through um, YouTube. So, okay. So, Eliberto, we're ready for that for item four. And yeah. and the PowerPoint for item four. Those slides were in your packets. Uh, give me one second. I for some reason. My internet booted me off. It didn't like the Longhorns. It didn't like the Longhorns. <laughs> I, I, um, yeah, it must be an OU computer. <laughs> All right. So oh, let me share my screen. All right, can we see the PowerPoints? We can. Yes. Okay. All right, so I think I mean this is a this is a conversation that was started uh, a couple of meetings ago actually um, and we talked again on December 1st and I think um, if you read the council com we we mentioned in there that we were going to have this conversation and so we will provide a verbal update to council on what we decide. I I don't think we need complete details tonight. I just think a, a direction from the board and then we will work on it throughout 2022 uh hopefully get it done early so whatever we choose we can move forward on it so so the things that i'm going to share i think for the most part you've all seen before um what you may not know so we we went once we made the decision for option a we now know that this is what we have a hundred thousand five hundred and seventy five unallocated dollars uh, from the human service funding set aside. Um, we talked about in the past, I think we gave four options. We, what I've done is from the notes and conversations with Karen, I've kind of um, worked a little more and expounded a little more on the options for you all to see. Um, so I think you've seen this before. So, L there is, is a great partner in as we try and reach people experiencing homelessness that are unsheltered. Um, this is a really a, a broadening of our outreach efforts in Longmont. This is something that I know that Karen and I have, have been advocating for, for quite some time to ensure that there's more outreach so folks are not languishing in Longmont. And so this is one option. Now, the caveat with this option is that we do have a grant application into the state uh, that may hopefully uh, cover these costs. We're just not sure if, if that's gonna come through or how much of that is gonna come through. So we just left it as an option because it may be something that we could potentially assist because this is actually a contract with the county. Uh, so we could potentially assist the county in covering the cost for this. Um, so that's option one. Option two, I talked about it before. You know, I think we, we do a pretty good job through our grant application to put out what the needs are, uh, but there may be other needs that, that our current applicants did not fulfill or we would want more investment in, um, we could create a supplemental request for proposal um, for either our current applicants or we could open it up to the broader community and say, you know, we have these, this funding and we have these needs that are, are being addressed, but we would like to, um, invest more in those needs, whatever those needs could be. Um, we could do that, or the board could choose 
uh, to retain a portion of this funding and saying, you know, as we go through the year, there may be issues that arise that we didn't even consider. And do we save some of this funding so that we could do a, a nimble RFP process? Um, luckily, um, you know, it's, uh, it's un we, 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 we have a lot of leeway in how we, we, we put out an RFP for this funding. So we could be pretty nimble and, and, and agile with it. That's option two. We talked about this as well. Um, we could explore, you know, council is setting aside funding for mental health and childcare. Uh, I looked into a current voucher system that exists through the Community Foundation and Jewish Family Services. It was originally meant for families that were impacted and individuals impacted by uh, the Cowwood fire. And it's, it, it's expanded in scope. And um, this is an estimated cost, but it, it basically it provides vouchers to providers. And I think you get up to five or six sessions uh, of mental, you know, of uh, with, with a mental health provider. And it's 100 per individuals and 150 per families. Um, or we could explore investing uh, funding in, you know, long months ongoing supporting action for mental health program that's been around for a while. Uh, and a lot of it does community, a lot of it is, is meant for community training around mental health first aid. Um, recently is, is focused a lot in the Latino community. Um, so we could support that. That's, that's another option. Finally, we could combine. We could say, we want to split this evenly. We feel that, that um, these two options or these three options are worthy of funding and we wanna split it uh, that way. Um, so those are the options that we have for us tonight to consider. I'm gonna stop sharing. And if anybody has any questions on the options, either I or Karen can try and answer. Um, but that's for the discussion. Ram. Thanks, Caitlin. Um, option one, you mentioned they're applying for a grant. What's the value of that grant? I think they're asking for 151,000 again. That's what we asked for the first time. Okay. Uh, when might we know whether that succeeds or not? Hopefully soon. I was told sometime mid-December and we are very close to mid-December. Okay. Other comments or questions from board members? Caitlin, this is Brian. I have a quick question. Go ahead. Um, Eliberto, so in regards to the timing on spending this extra money, is there an, an advantage or disadvantage with taking it to council? I assume council has to approve it, whatever the, the recommendation is from the board. Um, is there an advantage or disadvantage on the timing of that? Like, does it matter which month it happens in or if it happens right now versus in a month? I'll let Karen answer that one. Because I don't know. Oh, oh you will. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Well, I think what I can tell you, what I can uh, maybe question, um, I don't know, Brian, necessarily that we have to take this back to city council for, um, you know, I think for their authorization, you know, I think if we give them in terms of exactly how we in invest that, I don't know whether we would need approval or we would just, you know, in inform them. Um, so we might get a better sense for that, I guess, I guess, Brian, on Tuesday night uh, when we talk about the recommendations and we, and we, you know, talk generally about the uh, remaining unallocated funds and, and kind of see where um, where it, it takes us. So how's that for a non-answer? <laughs> that's, that, that's helpful. Thank you. I, I think um, I, I'm trying to wonder like, whoa, I, I'm trying to reason through what decision we can make if there's not a clear like, yes, let's fund B or whatever it is. Uh, if there's a decision we can make that 
in, that supports that flexibility where we don't, the board wouldn't have to go back to council. Right. You know, and I think the other thing that I would, I would say is that you know, we might want to have in our in our minds at, at some level about, you know, when when we might want to have a more specific plan. So, you know, maybe by the end of the first quarter of 2022 that we, you know, we really know how we are moving forward with this. So obviously, because um, if, if I'm if I'm counsel, you know, I just want to make sure that um we, you know, we move forward with some um, action on this um, and not just let that as, as uh, you know, delay that for too awfully long. So I think they, I think they might be interested in, you know, that by the end of the first quarter or something like that, that, that we will have a more definitive, um, you know, plan. But I mean, obviously we'll know in December whether or not, and again, you might not decide that you want to even uh, provide gap funding for the outreach, homeless outreach, even if the, the grant doesn't come through. But if there is some interest, you know, we'll know by the end of the year, I think probably for sure, if, um, if that funding is even needed. And, um, and then that helps us to know what else that we might want to do. Because the other thing we have not done is we have not <clears throat> really um, identified what we're going to do with, uh, with that $300,000 that we have um, out of the, um, the budget for mental health support and the additional, it was a hundred some thousand for, for childcare. So I think all of those efforts will have some clarity. We'll put some clarity on those in that first quarter of 2022. Thanks, Karen. Um, that was one of the questions I had was whether there was some preference there. Um, my sense is that, you know, I, I understand our idea of like, there can be more um, sort of emergent needs that come up mid year. At the same time, I think about the fact that like even a yearly application um, is a lot from a for agency partners to pull together. Um, and so even if we did an abbreviated one, that's still asking a lot for folks sort of mid cycle, if we want to do something like that. And then again, to apply for next year, because we don't do like the multi-year like Boulder does. And so that I feel like shortening it to less than a year between those is not, um, at least to me, does not feel like it, it gains us enough to sort of like counteract the, the work that goes into it for our agency partners and, and for us. Um, at least that's my initial sense is, you know, we're already only doing a year at a time, which is, you know, a relatively short period in the, the cycle of, of many of the nonprofits that we fund. You know, Caitlin, the only thing I would say to that is, or add to that is, is if, if you, if the advisory board decided to, um, to do that supplemental funding process with our current, our current, um, current funded agencies, then it, it really could be a, a super duper simple mm -hmm. application because you have all the rest of the data on, on those agencies. So, so depending on which, which route you wanted to go, it, it could be a really, a, a fairly simple process as so compared to if you open it up to everyone, so. Got it, so your thought would be to just open it to agencies we already funded potentially. That, that could be one option, right, yeah. right. Because then we just, we just do an amendment Right. We wouldn't do, do a whole new contract. Right. So it kind of depends on which way you wanted to go. So it, it could be simple, but if it, if we opened it up, then we um, to anyone that maybe hadn't received funding in the past or whatever, it's it's probably a, a little more detailed. But just FYI. Got it, Ellie Berto. Could you put the slides back up that show option to, and show options one and two again? That you've yeah, done? we'll do. Maybe I have them in here, but, oh, actually I, I do have them. Do you need me to still do it? Uh, no. Um, yeah, cause we do have those slides in your packet if you have your packet yep. open. So the- Caitlin, you... Oh, go ahead, Brian. I, I'm sorry. I and, and I apologize if I'm out of step here. It's 
uh, relatively awkward not having video and seeing everybody. Um, so I just wanted to say that for, in terms of considering these different options, I do tend to put a fair amount of weight on staff insight when it comes to particular needs. So the homeless outreach for, uh, from my perspective seems, you know, if, if Karen and Eliberto, if you're saying that that's a real need and you can see real benefit, that certainly carries weight. If the group were to lean towards that, then waiting until that funding, that other funding decision was made would make sense. Uh, so not knowing when to give that feedback, I just wanted to throw it in there. Mm -hmm. Appreciate that. Graham. Karen, did you want to jump in there? Well, you know, I, I, Eliberto, did we forget something? <laughs> so, so in looking at, you know, we, you know, we talked about, could we also use this pot to help supplement, um, you know, and maybe that's through the, an RP process, but to supplement the, um, Emergency, the utility assistance. We had talked um, about it. Yeah. Because when, when Graham popped, I was like, oh, yeah, that was that was a suggestion. And, and I don't remember what we, because obviously it's not reflected in these slides. And I don't it remember. It wasn't the original. I'm not sure why it didn't make, I think didn't we make the cut. I think we might have dropped it inadvertently. So, okay. so I, because I don't think we took it off the table. Right. Um. So I, I'm sorry, Graham, but when I saw you, I thought, oh, wow, I don't know. I don't see where that option is in here. Yeah, I think and it'd I be think awesome to visit that one. Um, yeah, but I think in general, the needs assessment tells us that affordable housing is the biggest problem in the city. And so yeah. I, I would otherwise lean toward that. And maybe utility assistment, assistance is a part and parcel of the, the issue of affordable housing. Um, and so I, I would lean in both of those directions heavily, you know, whether it's an RFP for just the affordable housing, um, you know, nonprofits or, or this, this initiative that's trying to get funding another route or, you know, a combination with the utilities. That's where I think the focus should be. Kimberly. It sounds like there's a, a benefit to waiting to see if the first um, option is funded um, and to learn a little bit more about some of the other options. I'm wondering if it would be helpful to eliminate the options that we feel we don't wanna pursue um, to narrow it down a bit to, to use our time in that way. I think that it would be nice to leverage the funds in other ways and not offer more funding to those who've already applied for city funds. So my suggestion would be to take that one off the table. Um, but I feel like all the other options are really valuable until we know more. Thanks, Kimberly. Um, I tend to agree um, with that. And also with what Graham said about, um, we know from the needs assessment that affordable housing is a major need in the community. And we also know that we generally have not gotten as many applicants and as much funding requests in that bucket as even we're willing to fund usually. And so I think um, focusing in on, on that feels like a, the right move and, and also waiting to see if we get that, if the city gets that grant funding. So my, I guess my suggestion would be that we, would if we're going to give a verbal update to council it would be to say like our our first choice would be to to supplement the funding for homeless outreach and then you know but dependent on whether we get the grant funding is given um and if it is then then to supplement i mean i think the other thing we really heard from provide from our nonprofit partners was the needs around child care um child so like the child care utility assistance those two things seem like sort of the next thing i mean just the the dirt the the struggles that every child care provider shared with hiring and retaining talent and actually being able to stay afloat during covid um that struck me as something that would not have come out in the needs assessment but that was super clear from 
every agency, even ones that were not providing childcare. Um, I feel like we had several that were like, we don't provide childcare, but like people not having childcare is a huge impact on the population we serve. So, yeah, so I agree. I guess that's like my long way of saying, I, I agree with what Kimberly said and what Graham said about, um, you know, kicking it a little bit, but also getting rid of um, the ideas that are not. So, okay. so to me, that'd be kind of like number four, where we may, maybe, so number two or number one is is first choice if if we don't get the funding, that, but that's to be determined. And then second choice is splitting it between childcare and utility assistance. And we could, and then we, we, we could delve deeper early on because the utility assistance, I, I'm working quite a bit on it with um, our housing folks. Um, um, and it, it is it is a it is a very large issue right now. Uh, and even if we were to put a hundred thousand toward it it would make a small dent in a big, big issue. Uh, but it would be a useful dent because our other funding is pretty restricted, restrictive, so. Yeah, I think that's what I would add to that is that these dollars could be used in scenarios that are a little more flexible mm -hmm. um, than, because uh, our other source of funding for assistance is our community development block grant funds. And so as, as those of you who have been on the advisory board for a while, you know that those, those are federal dollars. Those have, those have some pretty, well, those have regulations that we have to follow. So, um, so, and so I think, I think that, and then, um, but also Graham mentioned uh, um, housing. So, so I heard childcare, I heard utility assistance and I heard housing. Yeah, and I think Graham was maybe maybe alluding to the homeless outreach and then the grant and waiting to see if we got that. Is that what you were talking about, Graham? I think that if if that specific initiative gets the grant, we shouldn't fund it. I think right. that we'll let the grant right. keep that afloat for the year. But I think the general bucket of of affordable housing, homeless outreach is 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 certainly a high priority. Got it. So I, I feel like we have we have direction. something some direction and, and uh, to report to council saying we are waiting on this and then here is our other option and then we can def we can work out details like Karen said throughout the first part of the year. Any since this isn't something we're voting on, I want to just give everyone a chance if anyone has concerns with that approach. Otherwise, we can move forward with that. But I want to just open it up if if anyone else wants to chime in. I want to make sure that I'm on. Um, I had problems trying to sign on, so I missed the first half of the first part of the discussion. But I want to be sure that what I think I am hearing is where we indeed are. And that is from the last meeting, we were going to think about um, the, I think it was 108,000 um, over, is that right? So it's, it, it's 100, well, not, now that we made the choice, Madeline, we, we do have a more clear number. It's 100,575. Okay, um, okay. So um, that we were going to uh, look at ways to create maybe an emergency fund was one suggestion. Uh, and, and so is that where we are? Right, that's what, we, that's what we've been discussing. Okay, that I just, okay, wanted to be sure. Okay, then no, I, I'm, I'm with you. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Madeline, for asking and making yeah. sure. Yeah, for sure. All right. In that case, we will move on to um, item five on our agenda, um, funding allocation options for 2023. So Are you ready? Is... <laughs> <laughs> Not really. So, so Eliberto has some, has some more slides. So, you know, this is really just to plant the seed for future discussions um, because, you know, we'll, 
we'll be tackling this before, before you know it. So given that we saw what happened, you know, when we entered into this uh, funding process for 2022, um, at that point in time, we did not know what the amount of our funding was going to be. I wouldn't have guessed that the Lamont City Council would have just gone ahead and taken that leap to the, the 3% set aside. I mean, bless their hearts that they did. It just wasn't something that I anticipated that they would just say, take, make that move and say, let's go ahead and bump it to 3% in, um, in, in 2022. So, so I think what Eliberto and I were just brainstorming is that I don't think it's optimum that we, um, you know, with the process that we were using in terms of making recommendations about funding allocations. I, I, so we, we had this one year where we had $100,575 remaining, but I don't think going into 2023, we, we want to be in that position. Um, and so, so it just seemed like that we wanted to reconsider or think about different ways of allocating dollars in our next funding round so that we aren't caught in the same scenario um, next year. So we, we just started some discussion and we thought we would just uh, share some, um, share a couple of ideas and really open it up for, for some conversation and brainstorming just to, just to get things rolling for some future meetings in 2022. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. So yes, to, to Karen's point, we, these, these are, this is really to start the discussion. Uh, it's not to, we're not expecting, um, to land anywhere tonight, but we want for the board to start thinking about it. Um, so give me a second, can we go forward? So as you know, we are at, um, at 3% and unless there is some sort of economic downturn, the amount that we will have will continue to grow. Uh, and we, we really feel it might be time to review the funding process. So this is how it works right now. Uh, and this is what I have for council is too, as well. Um, you know, we all, we do that ensuring that they address their priorities areas and providing activities. That's kind of that binary, it used to be weighted and it became kind of a binary yes or no. Um, then the way that we Im implement the formula is you all, you all, score that they're addressing, that the programs are addressing community needs and demonstrating impact. Staff reviews, you know, their sound financial management and, you know, nonprofit best practices. And then we take an average score uh, between ours and, and, um, and, and, the, and the board. And the total, the total score, end of score determines what percentage of the requests will be funded. In this year's review, um, scores below 74 were not recommended for funding. Um, that's been how we've done it for the last few years. Um, and the formula, we, we said, you know, we're not going to take historical funding into consideration, which is different from years back. Here are our, our ceilings for priorities. And as we know, we never really hit the housing stability priority amount. And then as far as individual agency ceiling, we say, well, you can't receive more than 50% of the total priority ceiling. So that's the way that it has worked the last two or three years. Um, some of the unintended realities um, is like I mentioned, we have, a, we are, we, we have experienced some difficulties in achieving a goal, the goal of funding our, our top priorities. And that's due to the numbers of agencies applying to that priority. So for example, education always gets funded way above what it's supposed to get funded, but that's because we have so many education nonprofits in the area and housing typically gets funded lower 
actually, this is where that second bullet comes in. For example, even though EFA did not get funded this year, they've always received 16,000 and, and they've been told that, you know, there's no historical funding, but they have stuck to historical funding. I'm sure if they asked for more, they would get more. And while our process does have priority ceilings without a lot of guidance, there's a, there's a big disparity in the amounts that, of, that agencies apply for, and it allows potentially unproven agencies to receive much more than established agencies because they, they swung for the fences. Um, you know, you apply for more, you get more, if, if you score enough, of course. Um, so those are kind of things that we're dealing with um, that I've noticed in the last couple of years. Before I move on, any questions or thoughts on that? Okay. So here are the two ideas right now. The board could share more or we could come up with more, but here are two things that we, Karen and I have talked through um, and I've, I'm reaching out to Mile High United Way. So one thing is Mile High United Way has a, a, a strategic investment grant process sort of like ours. Um, and what they say is they, they set guidelines based on organizational budgets. Um, they say, look, if your budget is below 250,000, then you can get up to 10,000 uh, for your program, right? Uh, you can ask for less, but that's what you're gonna get. And um, if you have a budget over 250,000, you can't ask for less than 25 and you can ask as much as 75,000. Um, and so they, they provide guidance to their agencies that are applying using budgets as their, as their North Star on how they're gonna, how they're gonna apply for. Um, we could do something else. I just found that useful and helpful and simple and straightforward um that we we thought we we shared this idea um and then the other idea and this is one that I uh, actually I've had for a while uh and it's really about so we talk about our priorities i think i think the board at one point discussed this a little bit too so we talk about priorities um and what we've done is we is we've allowed agencies to you know apply their for their programs and then we we then sort them into our priorities. Well, one thing that we could decide is say, you know, instead of that, we are gonna identify the services that our, uh, our needs assessment has deemed to be needed. And we're gonna put out an application to meet those needs. So be much more targeted about what we want. Um, and, and so this, this allows us to decide what are the services that we're gonna fund, not just what are the areas. And we could be specific about how much we wanna fund those services. So if we say, for example, let's talk about housing, you know, I think this year our priority, I forget exactly what it was, it was close to, close to 300,000 was supposed to go to housing. Well, what if we said to agencies, we have 300,000 for housing here are the things that we want, rental assistance, utility assistance, case management, whatever the board decides. And then we, then we put that out there and say, your applications must address these services. And, this, and this, is, this is how much we have to spend on those services. Um, so that's another, that's another idea where we could be much more targeted about how we wanna use this funding uh, on behalf of, of uh, the residents of Longmont. Um, so those are my, those are the two ideas that Karen and I talked about. Um, again, this is just the beginning of the conversation. I'm not expecting to land anywhere, but I, I just really want, we just wanted to share this with you all and, and get, and start getting some feedback and thinking as throughout the year. Thanks, Eliberto. I think that's super helpful to see some, some potential options for targeting that. Cause I think um, we've definitely seen where it's like, 
they're doing good work, but it is, is it actually meeting, really meeting the needs? And it's like how, how to scale that and targeting it a bit better. Um, we've also talked about like organizations that ask for $5,000, maybe shouldn't be subject to the same scrutiny as organizations that are asking for $250,000, right? Like, um, and so I, I the, both of these ideas I think are um, things that could really help us um, target that better. Um, so I'm curious if other folks have thoughts or um, reactions. Kimberly and then Graham. I really love the idea of having um, the maximum identified. I don't know if having a minimum is necessarily as helpful, but informing organizations the maximum that they could be awarded, I think is a really great idea. I do wonder about um, identifying projects when I, I feel like the people on the ground doing the work probably are clued in overall better in terms of what the community needs than I'd be able to determine. So I'd be hesitant to project something out there instead of hearing the creative ideas of the nonprofits themselves. Um, and I like the idea of keeping it open still. So it just feels more egalitarian, more democratic that anybody can apply rather than limiting the, the number of applicants. So um, I think some really great ideas, super interesting concepts to, to explore. Graham. Thanks, yeah, I agree. It is, it is interesting to explore. Let me try to get my earplugs back on. It is interesting. I, I, um, I wonder if the concept of an operating budget is really a stable idea across so many different organizations. I mean, the little bit I know about accounting, there's, there's operating budgets and then there's operating budgets, you know, like sometimes it's discretionary what you put in what buckets and how you categorize money spent or earned. And so I don't know that I would hesitate about that. One thing um, that I think I've seen at uh, other, I, I don't know if it's through United Way ones or if it's been city ones is that um, is allocating a specific amount or limit for like new organizations. So if you want more than like X number of dollars, you have to have, you know, been a nonprofit for at least this long and have X number in reserve, you know, X amount of your operating budget and reserves or something like that. Whereas if you're a brand new community organization or something and you have a neat an interesting idea, like we you they want to encourage that. So they're like, well, you can apply for grants up to three thousand um, dollars or something like that. So another thought to just kind of like throw in there. I, I don't think we want to get like so specific that people have to jump through 15 hoops to figure out where they would fall. But I do love the idea of giving some more guidance so that it's not just like, because it does feel like agencies just in many cases, they have no idea what to expect. They don't know whether they can get 5,000 or 50,000. And like if EFA only applies for 16,000 every year, even though like we would probably give them more um, then that that's not really helping um, bolster that in our community. So, Karen. So actually, I just wanted to welcome our council liaison, Miss Shakita Yarborough. <laughs> so. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Sorry I'm late. I just got out of the training. I apologize. Um, yeah. So, so good to be back. Yeah. <laughs> so, so that was it. Just wanted to acknowledge our council liaison. And 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 Shakita does have a she has like double duty on this second Thursday night. So um, so moving forward, you know, once we get a new council member that represents uh Joan Peck's seat now that she's mayor, um, there might be some additional um, redistribution of lays on duties, but, um, but it's, it's good to have you back for the, the time that we have you, if, if it's short or longer term, either way, it's great to, great to have you back. All right. 
any other feedback or um, discussion about funding and allocation for 2023? Mm -hmm. And, and I guess the other thing, and I, I'm sorry, Karen. Uh, so if there is, you know, or if there are any other ideas or things you want Eliberto and I to research and bring back for future discussions, um, that, that would be great to know too. So maybe, well, anyhow. So if you want us to go further and say, you know, find out what some of the other um, government funders do or what happens with some of the other foundations or I don't know. We, we absolutely will do more research. Sorry, Karen. Karen Phillips, go ahead. I do, this is, has to deal with, I, I was hoping next year that we could do this, all the uh, assignments that we have to read through in September instead of October due to the election and everything. The, the month of October was just way too, uh, complicated. I, I don't know if we can do it any sooner than October, but if we could do all the processing in September. I think it would be easier for some of us anyway. I don't know if that's possible, but October was busy. I, I, I think we. I, the only challenge is we do this in a collaborative. And so we have to negotiate with our collaborative partners, the city of Boulder and Boulder County on when to release, because they release the application exactly when we do. So not that we couldn't, it, we just have to negotiate. I, I think we can, I think, I think earlier is better, but um, so, but you know, we're not locked into any particular date. So it's really what Eliberto talked about. Um, Madeline. Yes, thank you. I want uh, to, um, since December 31st will conclude my uh, term. And uh, there are a couple of things I'd like to uh, state uh, uh, as, as far as researching uh, and finding ways we can build to uh, better solidify. And, and that is for those, you know, uh, member, for those people that have repeatedly um, not improved in terms of demographics of their boys, the things that we've talked about for years. Um, I'd like us to come up with a, a more defined system, something that's more finitely defined in terms of, so people know what to expect uh, when they don't meet the mark. Um, I'd, I'd like that researched. And, and then some real consideration. I know the scoring is what we used, is what we decided to use. I think probably more so this year than ever, than I've ever seen it. And so, yeah, I'd, I'd like that to be one of the things that um, you consider. Another thing for consideration, uh, I'd like to see beyond, uh, I know Karen and Kathy and others have left. I'd like to, there to be some consideration also for those who have served in the past, um, uh, to, for there to be something, I don't know. Is there, uh, Karen or Alberto, is there some place I could go, for instance, um, with Bob, uh, Bob, Bob uh, a former chairperson. Is there somewhere I could go on Housing Human Services historical track record for lack of a better term that would tell me who did what when? Uh, is there where, somewhere that, where that, where I could go and, and, and that, would, that would be reflected? Ms. Madeline, I will. I just want to know why. Why do you? Why do you want to know who did what when? I want to be able to look back and and see. And I want it to be known that yes, uh, Madeline Woodley served here from 2009, 2010, up until 2021. And here's uh, 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 and for that service, 
uh, yeah, just just to say, as a civic, uh, ser civic ser civil servant, that that contribution was made. Where can I go to find to see that? As a citizen, beyond December thirty first, twenty twenty one. Well, I have an answer, but Deanna has her hand up. Yep. Go ahead, okay. Deanna. I mean, Karen, you probably have a better answer than me, but I was just going to say when I applied for this board, I read all the prior, I mean, not all of them, but I read the prior minutes for many, many meetings and everybody that serves on the board is reflected in the minutes. I mean, that requires some independent research to pull that information, but you can see who's serving and in what capacity for each meeting that we had, but there's, I don't think there's an easy way to find that information otherwise. Uh, and there, therein is my request. <laughs> well, like that is, be... that okay. is the answer. Deanna had the answer. You the gotta more. go digging. So, you know what, there, there is information on the, um, on the city's website, um, but, but it's not, it's not since the beginning of, of time. So, I mean, the, the, the human, the Housing and Human Services uh, Advisory Board in one way, shape or form has, has been around since 1980. So, right. so, um, so there is not an easy way to find that history other than obviously um, the, the clerk's office would have records of all of, um, minutes and agendas and whatever, I think they keep that since the beginning of, of time. That wouldn't be anything that you would be able to find other than contacting the clerk's office and, and getting that information. So, so, you know, here's what I would, so it, 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 we could find some information and we could go back to the beginning of, of time. Um, it, it would not be it would not be something that would be um, easy. So, yeah. and I'm not suggesting that. But I guess, Ma Madeline, my what my question would be, because uh, we're having it'll probably be the first part of, I would say, the first quarter of next year. Um, we're having some follow up discussion with our uh, city clerk's office because there was. Um, you, you know, we we did we did go out there, and you know, we did post uh, photos and our biographies of right. on on our website. Well, guess what? We are like the only ones that are doing that in the city of advisory boards, and and so one of the things that is how do I want to say this? One of the things that the city tries to be consistent. There's things that they try to be consistent with, we try to be consistent with. And so they would like for us to have a consistent way that all of our boards and commissions are presented in on the web pages. Obviously, we are non-conforming. <laughs> so, um, so we're going to have a conversation the, uh, the next part of, uh, so the first quarter of next year to really talk about um, you know, what, where, where can, where do we need to have consistency and where can we have some creativity in terms of what we include, include on board and commission web pages. So yeah, they need to catch up. Yeah. So, so anyhow, <laughs> you, you know, so if you have a suggestion about what you would like to see happen, but yeah, all that history um, for years and years and years is, is 2005. Is, I went, actually, I took Deanna's thing and I looked and I searched for the Housing and Human Services Advisory Board and it goes back to 2005. Have minutes, that's, the, that's the earliest minutes on the, if you look for the document search. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just that, I guess, you know, um, in that uh, none of these, uh, volunteerism is something that is priceless. It's invaluable. Uh, it has to be, uh, there are ways to be, for it to be rewarded that are not monetary uh, for the work that we do and we've done and the contributions we've made. One of the, like I said, when we came up with the whole thing of posting uh, who we are and, and what we did, that was one of the ways of, mm -hmm. of applauding our work. Mm -hmm. And so I'd like to, uh, so 
my request is that we build on that. And uh, while we are looking for consistency between boards and commissions and how we do things, um, I think that that's real important if you're going to continue to get quality volunteers. And yep. so that's uh, uh, it's it's important uh, to me. Uh, and I have talked with others that have served before and uh, yeah, it's like, thank you, but what else? Okay, it's more important to me than that. Um, yeah, and that, that does that mean I'm not going to serve? No, it means that later on it, it, it uh, at some point, I'll probably do something somewhere else. Mm -hmm. But for now, um, I think nine years is, is a substantial amount of a contribution. Mm -hmm. And then my other concern uh, is that we, uh, uh, Shakita, I'm glad to have Shakita back in this capacity, even more so. And, um, and so as the leading um, agency, <laughs> uh, in terms of, uh, you know, we talk about demographics and we, we and the importance of, um, of people leading uh, their boards, their, their staffs and whatnot. I think we are a leading entity. So I'd like to just make sure that once I'm gone, that, um, that, 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 and I know Karen, you, you're you're eagerly well, and then you're gonna be leaving too. So before I you go, am. <laughs> <laughs> so before you go, you and Kathy. Uh, yeah, I just want to make. What sure are you leaving, Karen? Do you know in not in the not too distant uh, future? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've been doing this for a long time. <laughs> She's leaving yeah. too soon. <laughs> right. Yeah. And, and I'm I'm somewhat concerned about you know what's going to happen when you do leave because you know it's that consistency and that quality that that comes with you and because you have you are an expert you know you got the years behind you or with you to 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 have you know become that the expert that you are and so we I just I hate, I would hate to see anything falter. Um, and those are my concerns. Okay. Thanks, Madeline. Surely. Any other, Shakita? Um, thanks, Madeline, for expressing how you feel in um in everything and. I just want to bring up something that you mentioned at the beginning of your request was making sure how are we holding these organizations accountable to their um, making sure that they're providing a diverse perspective on their boards and also on their staff. Um, we've been talking about this for a while now. And I mean, we're here. I mean, there's, I mean, I don't know what they need to do, but they need to do something. Um, the other boards are doing it. So maybe they need to collaborate with the other organizations who have diverse boards and diverse um, employees. But when are we going to start holding these organizations accountable? for not having that. I mean, we just look and say, well, we, we ask them those questions and we talk to them and we know they need funding. That's not the issue, but I just want to know how are we going to start holding them accountable and how will we hold them accountable? So I, I don't know if that, so I made a I made notes about that, and I think you know when we are looking at our um, you know how do we be more clear in our expectations um, if if agencies don't hit the mark. So so some of this might be as we are preparing um, instructions for our um, applicants. So so just having some more clarity about expectations, um, and I think to continue to have this discussion about. You know, so when do we say it's 
we're we you know we're we're reducing funding or 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 something in that regard. So so it I made a note for when we are having this conversation going into the 2023 process, how are we going to um, address scenarios where agencies aren't hitting the mark around something that we really expect them to do. You know, I, and so, so Shakita, since you're also our council liaison, you know, I, I, I think that, um, you know, we, the city, as we are recruiting for advisory boards and commissions, we might want to look at how we, um, you know, how we, re how we really recruit in ways that we get um, in, in terms of who applies for city boards and commissions. So I, I think that's an, an area to look at too, that we've, we've tried to address in, in, in this board and commission in the Multicultural Action Committee, um, you know, so. How do we still hold ourselves accountable as well as other, um, you know, boards on uh, on our, our agency organization? So, I will say that if it wasn't for Eliberto, I wouldn't have never been on the board. Yep, exactly. Right, you know. So it, you're right. You are absolutely correct. Yeah, we did some recruiting. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. yeah. It, 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 it actually did take extra effort. You really, it, it, it really has to be important to the organization. It has to be important and it has to be, when it's not important as it has been proven that it's not to some, that there must be consequences. And I mean, we can start at a 50% reduction. I think, um, you know, putting on my former like, lawyer hat which unfortunately i hate to i hate to do i think you know i chiquita since you're here too and karen mentioned the city i'd also love to see the city as a whole like we the board can do things and do things around scoring but i also think that it's really important for the city council to um to lead on this as well um and potentially even say like here are things that we think are important in terms of this funding. The city is allocating this money for this board to then allocate to those. And we can make those decisions, but it's gonna go up and down often with changes in board members and so forth. And so to the extent that the city needs or wants to put in you know, qualifications or expectations around serving the diverse population, um, I think that would be welcome. Um, you know, I don't, I, I think it could be really easy for us to, to start cutting funding. And I also don't want um, someone to come back and say, you know, look, look at the board minutes and then come in with a, oh, you're discriminating. Like, you know, we have people in our community that are going to come in and be like, oh, because this board didn't have two people who were people of color, you didn't fund them. And so like the city is now subject to questions or, you know, things like that. I think it's super important to have that diversity in board members and to see that progress. And I wanna make sure we do it in a way that the city is supportive and protected from community, from the community members who might not believe in that. Um, you know. Sort of put it, I I'd say proactively putting it above reproach, um, so that it's not so that no one's caught on the back foot um, when we do that. I agree one hundred percent, but I totally. Um, so the city of Longmont is definitely growing, and we are going to continue to grow, and I'm believing that we we are going to be more diverse. And so when we have that pop more diverse population, which means more, more money, more needs and all of that. So when we look at these boards, back to what Karen was saying, it, it is very important. Um, we have to do our part, as, uh, our part in recruiting those diverse people, perspectives, diverse yep. perspectives. Um, at the same time, we've been allowing organizations to still constantly 
-hmm. slip by without, and I'm not, I'm not saying like cutting their funding, but there needs to be a higher rating or less of a rating by not, you know, having the, the, diver, the minimum of however many people of color they need to have on their board or diverse boards, you know what I'm saying? Um, that's very important because if you can have the uh, people with disabilities that have their board members are over 50% with disabilities, that's ideal. I mean, that's the whole point, right? Um, and if you are serving your serving, um, most of your clients are Hispanics, and you only got one person that's speaking Spanish or one Hispanic that's on on your board or that's an employee, but yet you have twenty five employees, that's an issue to me. So. Um, I'm just speaking like, I get what you're saying. I'm not saying like no funding or anything like that. I just want to know what measures we can put to hold them accountable. Um, it's important that when people come here and um, leaders come here and we have more leaders, we want them to see that, that we are doing our part too, you know, and making sure that we're representing our community. And that's important. Graham. So to me, a part of holding others accountable involves, you know, being willing to show up and, and help those people achieve those things um, in a large way. And that's, that I think is, is important in leadership. And so I, I'm wondering what the feasibility of, you know, we have this, this funding requirement. If you don't show up to the hearing, you don't get any funding. Like you, you don't even qualify, right? We just, it's not, and so we have $100,000. I mentioned this before, like, what if we spent some of that money to have a city funded training for nonprofits to improve diversity and recruiting. And so we're putting our money where, where our mouth is, so to speak. And then we're saying, Hey guys, really clear in this finite way, you know, we are going to provide you guys and gals, you organizations with this learning opportunity and come alongside you and support you. Cause this matters to us. And if you don't participate, then we're not going to consider you as an applicant. And so I'm, I'm not sure if that's feasible legally or emotionally or what, you know, in all the, the planes of, of city existence, but I, that would be my vote is to, to figure out something like that. And I'm sure we can do it for less than a hundred thousand. I'm sure we could do it for under 50 K if I had a guess to hold a, a half a day seminar for the nonprofits and then make it a toll gate for, we don't even look at it unless you go to this training because diversity is important and you guys and gals need to, to figure it out. So. And Graham, we did talk about actually um, letting them feel, feel where, you know, where it mattered and that's in the pocket. We did do that. And we said that um, we would, uh, for those that were just blatant, uh, where the, no efforts, no mention, no nothing, just complete disregard that as board members, we were going to let that show in our in our scoring. I don't know that we did that or not. I know I did, but I don't know. Um, I don't know if we came up with a consistent way to apply it. But that was one of the things we talked about that could be, you know, take another look at it uh, in addition to what you're saying. We, we also had a multiplier on the question around mm -hmm. that um, to make sure that it was not evenly, um, it wasn't just like one of five things. It was actually weighted more heavily than, so, than several of the other factors um, as part of the scoring. I really like that idea, Graham. All right, Karen Phillips. Yeah, I was gonna say too, a lot of the people that did came to the uh, 15 minute questions and things, some of the organizations do have uh, you know, diversity section and they try to work with it. So it, some of the organizations already do address that. So I don't know, I'm sure that's, taken into consideration too but i just remember some people saying oh yeah we have a 
you know, when we have someone that comes in and tries to help us figure that out and that kind of thing. So some of that does go on with some of the organizations already. So if everyone could do that, it'd probably be great. <laughs> All right. Other thoughts or things that we need to talk about regarding funding process for next year? Deanna. I guess I would just add to this conversation about prioritizing diversity of board membership that they come to us for money. And if they don't get money, they're going to fix why they don't get money, unless our money doesn't matter, in which case maybe they don't need to come to us for money, right? So I feel like some of these organizations, I mean, I know this is only, only my second year going through this, but I, I know they've heard this song and dance from us for years and years and years, right? So at some point, particularly, I think if we did Graham's suggestion and really kind of showed them the way and tried to help them, if they still don't do it, I'm not opposed to withholding funds to really motivate people to get it in gear because the money is what fixes it, right? If they don't get the money, they're gonna fix it. So I just wanted to express that I would support that approach as well. In tandem, I think with a like carrot and stick sort of approach that we will help them figure it out and really work with them. I think it works really well. So I would support that. All right. Uh, the last item on our agenda is, is uh, other business. Is there other, are there other items we need to cover tonight? I think this, uh, Deanna, go ahead. And then Karen Rooney. I just wanted to give a shout out to Madeline for having been so involved. And this is her last um, board meeting with us. And I just want to express how much I have valued your input and experiences on the board and your presence. And I just wanted to say thank you for being here and um, donating, donating so much of your time and energy and thoughtful consideration to the activities that this board does. So thank you, Madeline. Thank you. Thank you, Deanna. I appreciate that. Yes. I'll miss you guys. <laughs> Sharon. So, yeah, so I was going to say the, the same thing. So, so Madeline, um, staff has a little gift for you. So next time that you're in the city offices, stop by my office. Um, just a little, uh, we usually try to do a little recognition for outgoing board members. And so, um, so anyhow, we, um, we would love to give that to you the next time that you are you are around or we can make other arrangements to get that to you. Absolutely, I'd be more than happy to stop by. As a matter of fact, I don't know how to share my screen, but I had, uh, had taken a picture of something, Karen, you gave me on, I think it was December the third, no, it was December, it was 2010. And <laughs> it was a very, very, very beautiful, um, ornament, tree ornament. And I had taken a picture and I am gonna send it to you because I wrote on the box and I saved it and I put, um, it was when we had the very, uh, we were at the pump house, I think. Ah, yeah. Okay, that and, and we had our Christmas celebration there and you gave me that. And up until three days ago when Koki broke it. Oh! <laughs> I had it and I was in the box. So now all I have is the box, the box with your name, the date and everything where it was given and all of that. But I took pictures of it right before she got a hold of it, uh, uh, to it and broke it. <laughs> so I'm, I'm elated. That's why I was so excited. Oh my God, I something to replace it. But uh, thank you guys so much. I, and I will, I'll stop by probably tomorrow. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Shakita. Sorry, I'm talking so much. Um, my first day as a council liaison. But, um, and I know it's Madeline's last day. I do. And Erica, I just want to say real quick, Erica, thank you so much for putting up with me and being patient because 
I'm all screwed up. But thank you anyway for helping me out as much as you do and be patient with me. So um, so I do want to express in, in so that the board can understand. And I know many of you probably really do understand, but it just I just have to mention this, that when Madeline is talking about her services, as you all know, that there are not very many Black people that are on boards that you serve on. We are here, although it may not be very many of us, but we are here. And it's important that all the services and the boards, this woman is, I don't know how many committees and boards that she's on. She's on so many. And what would, I don't know where these committees and boards will be without her perspective, all the years that she has served. And so I'm just saying, because I know before me being on council, I mean, now I'm still on the same amount of boards and stuff, but I too was on so many committees and boards because there aren't people representing that little small portion of our community and not just me, but for me, single parents, you know, and um, women and, you know, the, all those intersections that, that I experience, you know, within my life. And so that's why it's so important to have those diverse uh, perspectives. And sometimes we do get tired, but we have to be there. We have to be there. And I just wanted to express that and my gratitude for Madeline, because these are her retired years and, and I appreciate her being, you know, given her time that is irreplaceable and you can't stamp a, a dollar on it, you know? so. Um, I appreciate you and we don't know where some of the boards and committees would be if you had not um, been on them and recruiting because she was recruiting me for other boards years ago. So I'm so appreciative of her and I'm so appreciative of also of Ellie Berto of recognizing people in the community and asking them to, to be on boards and say, hey, I think you'll be a good fit and things like that. We have to do that as you all are leaders and so we have to continue when you see someone who believes the way you believe in as far as what's good for the community and they will be non-judgmental and want to help the community, let's do that, let's recruit. But then understand though that burden that a lot of people of color have to go through to make sure that voices are heard and those perspectives are there too. So I just wanted to say that and thanks again, Madeline. Thank you, thank you guys, thank you Shakita. I, I I really appreciate it, uh, and it is important. It's very important. So I don't plan to go anywhere. I will continue to try and do whatever you ask me to do. So thank you guys. Karen Roney. And just in case you're wondering, the council did reappoint Graham and Kat to the advisory board for another three-year term. So congratulations yes. to Graham and Kat. And our um, two new members are Stacy Duncan and Robert um, Pudum. So uh, they will be joining us in January. Okay. And I'm still able to come as a guest, right? It's a public meeting. <laughs> <laughs> The public can, <laughs> we welcome the public. Yes, yes. <laughs> and someday we'll go back to being in person and you can always show up. Right, <laughs> someday. <laughs> someday. Yeah, I'm hopeful. Yeah, well, thank you guys. I can't thank you enough. You made my day. You really did. Yes. On that very, uh, very positive note, because Madeline is, has been a great um, addition to the board, um, I will entertain a, a motion to adjourn. So moved. <laughs> All right, do we have a second? Deanna. All right. See you all in about a month. And Karen and Aliberto, I will see you next week. All right. Happy holidays, everybody. Happy holidays. I'll see you tomorrow, Karen.
Okay, bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Good night.